Uh, uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us for our TAD talk series. Uh, my name is Ed Steger, and I am the president of the National Foundation on Swallowing Disorders. Uh, we thank you for joining us this evening and hope you find this series to be helpful. <clears throat> Before we begin, I'd like to share a few announcements about upcoming events. The NFRSD is currently offering a $500 scholarship to an individual demonstrating excellent dysphagia, volunteerism, and advocacy. And the emphasis is on international work that is being done. The deadline to apply is the end of the month. We are also in the process of preparing for Dysphagia Awareness Month, which takes place in June. Uh, Dysphagia Awareness Month is a statute passed by Congress in 2008. And we're looking for members of our community to share their story with us to help raise awareness. <clears throat> uh, uh, we are also hosting our annual t-shirt fundraiser and this year's shirt was designed by Dr. Ianisa um, Humber. Shirts start at $35 and it's a great way to start a conversation. It also makes a great gift for your favorite SLP mentor or student or patient. And the deadline for this is fast approaching on May 14th. Uh, lastly, we have an exciting Meet the Maker presentation on May 17, describing new technology involving electrical stimulation to the inside of the throat that you will not want to miss. We are sending out more information on each of these events in the post webinar. Um, survey tomorrow morning. <clears throat> For those of you not previously joined our virtual events, please note you will be muted throughout the presentation. <clears throat> we encourage you to ask questions at any point uh, and during the presentation, uh, using the question box in your virtual webinar toolbar. Uh, there will be plenty of time at the end to answer your questions. <coughs> the presentation will be recorded and made available on our website. We recognize that the international time differences make it challenging for some of our global audience to attend the live events. Um, there are now ASHA CEUs awarded for this presentation, but if you reach out to us, we're happy to provide a certificate and participation. <clears throat> uh, 
before we meet him, I would like to recognize Prophet Diagnostics for the continued support of the NFOS team in the form of an unrestricted educational grant. <laughs> and that allows us to make online early learning events free to our community. <clears throat> <clears throat> For those of you who made a donation upon registering for this event, I want to thank you. It is only with the generous donation of our sponsors and community members that we are able to advance our mission of serving those impacted by this phase. Uh, I also want to recognize some other long-term sponsors, uh, Passe Neuron, Simply Thick, and Cranial Rehab. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Lisa Blumenthal. Uh, Lisa is a medical speech language pathologist serving patients with complex swallowing and communication disorders for over 25 years and currently serves as the co-director of the Head and Neck Cancer Center at UC <clears throat> UCSP Moore Cancer Center. This is a dedicated clinician who has supported many people living with dysphagia in our community, as well as people joining us on this call. We're grateful for Lisa, who is volunteering her time this evening. Uh, Lisa joined our board in 2018, and it's my pleasure to turn this over to Lisa. So Lisa, please take it away. All right, let's see, how do I go on here? Okay, everybody, it is a great pleasure to be here. Um, I just wanna take a moment um, to really issue a shout out to both Elizabeth and Ed. Um, I, it is through their passion, their ambition, and their fierce commitment to advancing dysphagia awareness and education that really allows we clinicians as well as patients to thrive. And so I'm so grateful for your support and your commitment. Um, I'm so grateful to be part of this organization and I encourage everybody that's on the call to find a way to take part, whether it's in the foundation, supporting the foundation or in local advocacy groups um, in your area. So with that, I just wanna get started. Um, we're switching gears a little bit. So for really the majority of my career, I have um, helped individuals with dysphagia. Um, and I have worked with folks with head and neck cancer. But financial toxicity, just to be honest, was actually a topic that was given to me. I had to uh, give a talk on it and had to research it. And it was a sort of fact-finding mission that really lit something inside of me because I was so astounded by some of the statistics and some of the information. And it really has made me kind of rethink the way that I look at this um, and the way that I approach this, uh, this condition. So I think everybody would agree and understand that cancer care, medical care, is expensive, right? So when we think about our cancer patients, before we even see them, they have to go through a whole workup. They might need expensive diagnostic tests. PET scans, CT scans, biopsies, C 
seeing a surgeon, all of those things that even happened before, one thing is even done for them. And that can actually be generalized across different medical conditions. So we understand that cancer care costs money. But what we're gonna talk about today far extends beyond that notion and the pocketbook, and it's expensive. I'm gonna ask each of you to think for a minute what it must be like to be in a situation where you're essentially plucked out of your life, where you actually lose the ability to care for yourself, you worry about your ability to care for your family, you worry about keeping a roof over your head, food on the table. These are all the things that can impact head and neck cancer patients. And so in the spirit of patient-centered care, I've also included a number of quotes from some of my most favorite patients. You know, I wish I could say that this was an uncommon scenario. Uh, the sad reality is that I, I, I live and practice in Southern California. Um, and so in my facility, uh, we see a very high percentage of Medi-Cal or in other states, it would be Medicaid uh, patients. And what that means is a lot of those individuals are lower income uh, people who unfortunately do not have access to a supplemental dental program. So if you're an individual uh, with Medi-Cal and you wanna go see a Medi-Cal dentist, the average wait time in this city to see a Medi-Cal dentist is 27 weeks. So let's think for a second, you've got a bunch of teeth that are rotted that need to be pulled and you're gonna get started on this journey. We know that these patients, it is paramount that they receive dental care prior to going into surgery and starting radiation, because once radiation is done, everything changes. And our surgeons know that. And so our very generous surgeons will oftentimes pair extraction of teeth as part of their resection, reconstruction, and neck dissection. So as speech pathologists, as providers, we talk about toxicity all the time. We deal with toxicity all the time. We traditionally think about things like dysgeusia or xerostomia or odynophagia. These are the things that we think about. Financial toxicity, I would argue, is something equally egregious and can impact patients in a whole host of ways. Now, just like those physiologic toxicities, financial toxicities occur across a spectrum. So it can range from individuals who report this disturbed their ability to enjoy vacations or it was, a, it was a burden. And that can extend all the way to the right of that equation where people actually exhibit financial ruin. And that can mean complete bankruptcy. And in some cases, even homelessness. Now, unfortunately, financial toxicity is associated with a whole host of very, very unpleasant sequela. And that's, I think all of us would agree that reductions in quality of life, that's pretty intuitive. But what people don't think about is that those individuals that suffer from higher financial toxicity are more likely to report having greater symptom burden. They're less likely to adhere to the things that we ask them to do and recommendations that we provide. And we'll find out at, in this talk these individuals actually have poor mortality uh, rates, so higher risk. Now, financial toxicity is going to be impacted by a whole host of factors, and some of those are demographics, so patients' age, their sex, their race, their income, where they work, what their uh, education levels are, and then it's going to be impacted, of course, by specific uh, cancer uh, statistics, so what stage of cancer do they have and what types of resources and services are they going to need in order to treat their cancer? And what makes these folks different uh, than many other types of complex diseases is cancer patients are going to have costly needs well after they're done with cancer treatment. Now let's talk about statistics regarding cancer itself as a broad entity. So by the year 2026, we are going to see 30 million um, cancer survivors. So what that means is, why are we seeing such a uptick in survivors? It's a good thing. 
that has a lot to do with the fact that we are essentially in a renaissance, if you will, of cancer care. So we have developed a, a very exciting regimen of treatments that are very, very precise therapeutic agents that are designed to be able to address specific tumor phenotypes. That's very, very exciting. But the challenge is all of these services come with a cost. And we also then know that we're going to have a larger number of people that are going to be living longer, but they're going to be living with the residual sequela that are associated with their head and neck cancer and their treatment. Now, when it comes to cancer survivors and when it comes to financial toxicity, I don't think the majority of folks know some of these very, very frightening statistics that when we look at bankruptcy, you look at 62% of all bankruptcies in the United States that are reported all have to do with medical debt. And this was a statistic that was really shocking to me is that of those bankruptcies, almost 80% of them actually had health insurance. So this misnomer that we have insurance, right? So we're gonna be covered is incorrect. It is dramatically incorrect. And the number of Americans that are dealing with debt and being in collections that impacts their credit and their ability to essentially buy a home or buy a car is staggering. And what's frightening is of those individuals who file for bankruptcy as a result of a cancer diagnosis, they are 80% more likely to die. So those are statistics about cancer as a broad entity. When we introduce or start thinking about head and neck cancer, unfortunately, these numbers even become more staggering. And that's because head and neck cancer patients have a disproportionately higher level of financial toxicity as compared to any other cancer diagnosis. Now that has a lot to do with some of the demographics associated with head and neck cancer patients. It also has a lot to do with the fact that we are seeing a growing number of individuals that are diagnosed with HPV-mediated head and neck cancer. Those individuals tend to be younger in age. So here we are, a 40-something-year-old man. What are we doing? We're just plucking him out of his life, right, for months at that peak, that age of peak professional performance. And so this can have, unfortunately, just a really, really detrimental effect on their and their family's quality of life. So as a result of that, many head and neck cancer patients take on what we call coping strategies that really offset the cost of this care. And we'll talk about that in a moment, that these coping strategies, unfortunately, are very counterproductive in terms of facilitating good oncologic outcomes as well as functional outcomes. We also know that in many of these patients, their ability to return to work is significantly lower than any other form of cancer. And that has a lot to do with different issues. Patients might uh, continue to have severe swallowing problems. I have many patients that don't know how they're going to figure out how to do their tube feedings while they're at work, or they've had tongue surgeries and can't communicate well, or they have altered cosmesis and they don't feel comfortable being in a professional work environment. These patients have long-term physical, functional, and psychosocial morbidities that not only preclude them from going back to the workplace, but oftentimes generate the need for continued supportive care, which unfortunately, again, costs money. When it comes to employment, the numbers regarding head and neck cancer patients that are able to successfully retransition and reintegrate into their workplace is unfortunately abysmally low. So following treatment, 48% of head and neck cancer patients will reduce their workload and a third of them will leave the workforce entirely. They will either go on permanent disability or they essentially will become, you know, just stay at home folks because they don't either have the skill set to resume their regular job, they don't have the stamina, the energy, 
the capacity to do so. And sadly, this statistic is, is disproportionately um, impacted, impacts low-income women, where only 57% of low-income women remain employed as compared to 95% of high-income women. So I mentioned this notion of coping strategies, and we normally think of that in a positive light, right? But unfortunately, when it comes to financial toxicity, we're talking about coping strategies that essentially, again, are very counterproductive because when patients, when people are unable to manage costs, what they end up doing is they end up turning financial and non, uh, non-compliance. And these coping mechanisms, like I say, can impact their quality of life, but also their oncologic outcomes. So it's intuitive to think, okay, we're gonna go through our savings. We might take out high interest loans. We might then start modifying what we are recommended or prescribed. These individuals are found to not fill prescriptions. They may not show up for follow-up visits. You know, we speech pathologists will see a patient that doesn't show up, right? Well, maybe we should ask them or try to figure out, is, is there anything going on in terms of financial toxicity that is impacting their ability to even come to our center? Being able to have a viable car, transportation, gas, resources, pay for parking. These are all the things that could impact their ability to just show up for an appointment. These individuals are gonna cut back on things that provide them with some sort of balance, like leisure activities, and then even essentials like clothing and food. What ends up happening in a lot of these families is that other family members end up having to compensate by working very, very long hours. And I recently had a patient just last, late last week where both the husband and the wife clean houses for a living and the husband is undergoing treatment and so their eldest daughter actually had to drop out of college um, in order to go with her mom to work and be able to maintain their same level of income um, in order to help support their family. So this study, it's not surprising. When we start thinking about these compensations, this, this little statistic is very powerful because what it shows is that individuals who report having very high financial toxicity are going to have worse overall survival rates and worse cancer specific survival rates than those with low financial toxicity. So if you're not showing up for your appointments, you're not filling your prescriptions, you're not able to adhere to the things that we ask you to do, there is a cost to that. And unfortunately, this cost can impact their survival. This is a very regular sort of routine situation for us where we have patients almost daily, I feel like amongst our team that will beg us not to recommend getting their feeding tubes out because the idea that we remove that tube and then they are forced or faced to start to think about how they're going to manage and pay for, let's say buying a six pack of Boost at CVS, you know, that can cost 10 or $12, whereas they are willing to drink their tube feeding. Now at our institution, we're very sensitive to that. We actually, uh, almost as a rule, will prescribe uh, supplements that can actually, are, are palatable um, by mouth and also can go through tube feeding. So we use a lot of Kate Farms products um, because those patients can transition and, and we they can continue to read receive their formulas um, and we can actually work with them and have them try to drink some of their food and administer some of their food. And so it's, it, it helps alleviate some of the financial burden that is associated with us advancing their PO intakes and those recommendations. Now, as a speech pathologist, we don't know much at all about insurance, right? Nobody teaches us about insurance. And I will argue and champion that while we're not insurance experts and it's not our role or within our scope to be talking about what's covered and what's not covered, it is important for us to know. It's important for us to know some basic things. 
So one misconception that I had is I thought Medicare covered everything. I thought it was a free for all. So you have Medicare, you turn 65, you don't have to work with, worry about healthcare anymore. And I found out that that was very much incorrect. So for those of you that don't know, Medicare covers 80%, 80% of charges. And therefore, if you are 65 and you want to be covered and not run the risk of having to pay 20% of what could be a $100,000 bill, then you need supplemental insurance. And so this study in 2016 highlighted that individuals will spend an average of about $6,000 a year, forget about cancer, they're just gonna be paying for extra premiums that are associated with that supplemental insurance that helps cover that gap, right? In contrast, Medi-Cal or Medicaid in other states strict, strictly limit any form of cost sharing. What that means is that an individual is not going to be responsible for a portion of the bill. So really, despite their low income, Medicaid or Medi-Cal enrollees actually do receive comparable access to services. There's a whole host of other issues that go along with that level of insurance. Um, but at our institution, many of our Medi-Cal and Medi-Cal level HMO uh, individuals are able to get transportation covered. They're even able to get some um, form of caregiving in the home. It really just depends. But what I really want to highlight is that financial toxicity can impact anyone. It doesn't matter if they have more resources or less resources, if they have good insurance or if they're uninsured, it can impact any socioeconomic group. And I just think that that is extremely important for us to know and appreciate. Just a very quick anecdotal story, because it just happened, is we recommend um, patients on clinical trial, that they must have a fluoroscopic swallowing study prior to their trial. And so I had an individual come in and um, his, all of his, his patient reported outcome measures were zero. So this guy doesn't report having any swallowing impairment. He has a very low grade tumor. He's a young guy um, and really, uh, 99.999, his swallow study would likely be normal. So as he walks in to see me, there's a receipt. And I see a receipt and I just was looking at it and it showed that he paid $1,482 for my fluoroscopic swallowing study. And I asked him about it and he said, yeah, I just put it on my credit card. I don't know how I'm gonna pay the bill. And he started to cry. So I walked him right out <laughs> And we went back to the check-in and I said, reverse this charge. And we found out a different way to do it. Um, I actually was able to send him back to an institution that was in network for him, for them to do the study. I gave them some parameters and they provided me with some of the data. So it definitely does behoove us. We want to administer care in the best way. That care costs money. And at least it, it does behoove us to be sensitive to some of these insurance issues. I had no idea about this. I had no idea that our surgeon orders, you just got diagnosed with cancer and your surgeon orders a PET scan to find out, you know, is there any distant metastasis? It completely helps determine what curative treatment is going to be administered and insurance might say no. We had a patient a couple weeks ago that lives, uh, let's it's in Fallbrook, so lives very far away and was diagnosed with head and neck cancer. And his insurance company told him that he had to go to radiation at an institution that was 112 miles away when there was one that was three miles away. But that was their, that was their thinking. So, you know, I, I really don't know where we go with some of this um, insurance stuff, but I also know that our, our, our providers are always willing to have peer-to-peer -peer discussions and hopefully resolve some of these horrific issues. This is just a little graph that highlights really what individuals experience in terms of out-of-pocket costs during head and neck cancer treatment. So I want us all to think about for a moment of what we ask our patients to do. They, they see a dietitian, they see a lymphedema therapist, they see a physical therapist, they see a speech pathologist, right there, right? 
that could they could each have a $50 copay for each one of those. That's $200 for just one day. That doesn't include transportation. That doesn't include parking at our institution. So the out-of-pocket cost that these folks experience is staggering. Then we also have to think about the fact that many of these individuals are really, really stuck. So they are run the risk of losing their sponsored um, medical coverage. And so that will make it very difficult for them to take any time off uh, because their worry is if they lose that sponsored insurance policy, then they might have to shift to a very expensive plan like COBRA or private insurance, which essentially would be catastrophic. So COVID made things even more difficult. I'm very happy to say that these um, sort of specific situations, which I have to say happened routinely, are no longer happening. But we had, we had cases where individuals didn't come for their chemo. Individuals, because they were told that their children couldn't come in the building and they didn't have childcare and they didn't have schools. So the notion that these special circumstances happen and what this did to individuals um, that were undergoing treatment during that horrific period was catastrophic. Now we all know that in our clinics, we utilize patient reported outcome tools for everything, right? We use the E10, the MDaddy, uh, the Voice Handicap Index, and yet such a few number of institutions um, routinely put out patient reported outcome measures that look at the presence of financial toxicity um, in their patients. Now, they do exist. There are three primary tools that are used. There's the cost, uh, which is the most widely used, but it is pretty lengthy to administer. There's the financial distress questionnaire. It's only two items. And the financial index of toxicity. And really, it doesn't matter which one you use it really is imperative. And we actually just launched a, a pilot program uh, where we have uh, instituted, we have a financial counselor um, and we'll be looking specifically at patient reported outcome measures um, in uh, one of our disease sites. We're hoping it's head and neck cancer, um, but it uh, is something that our institution has realized that we need to administer in order to pick up on this very, very concerning side effect. So this was this was a gut-wrenching one. Uh, Liliana had a, a very, very severe advanced nasopharyngeal cancer um, and her husband came the first session and then I didn't see him again for about six months. And so she had to battle this alone. Uh, Liliana was from Ecuador. Um, and they could not afford to bring out her family to help her. Um, so we were actually able to hook her up with a uh, mama's kitchen. It's a, a local program that actually does sort of meal deliveries and actually even allows for some customization of textures that really, really helped provide Liliana with at least some stable, stable food that she was able to swallow. So, this study by Maddie took a little, took a, a deep dive actually, looking at financial toxicity using the cost as their patient reported outcome measure to try to identify and really kind of wrap our arms around sort of what impacts financial toxicity in individuals. And so what this study found is that those patients uh, that are married tend to have less financial toxicity as compared to uh, their counterparts. Patients with lower education levels also have worse financial toxicity. I thought this was very interesting that those with larynx and hypopharynx tumors had the worst financial toxicity. Um, you might hypothesize that that has a lot to do with their inability to communicate, severe dysphagia. And for every increase in 10 years, the cost scores improved. So really older individuals had less financial toxicity. And I think Again, we can conceptualize why that is. So these individuals that are older don't have some of those same stressors of taking care of young children and daycare or, or college. Um, and so their cost scores improved um, as compared to those younger adults. 
So this study similarly aimed to look at predictors of financial toxicity, as well as identify what are some of those adverse consequences that can take place following radiation therapy. Um, and this used a cohort of patients from a, a large cancer center and VA. And so they used also uh, the cost as well as some other uh, sort of symptom specific patient reported outcome tools. So they found some very similar findings as compared to the prior study where younger age, um, younger age and lower medium household income was associated with worse financial toxicity. And some of the things that they found, which they were able to quantify, was that these individuals with more financial toxicity were more likely to skip clinic visits, they were more likely to be non-compliant with taking their medications, and they were more likely to need infusions. They sort of would hit the wall, like go, 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 and then literally hit the wall and require supportive um, infusions. There was also a higher rate of uh, unplanned hospital admissions, but it did not meet statistical significance. And these individuals were also more likely to require feeding tubes. Now, sadly, we as providers do a very poor job of talking about finances and talking about what patients can do to try to mitigate some of this financial toxicity. We don't do a very good job of introducing that topic, of getting information and having these conversations. So a study that was done by a group of oncology social workers found that only 25% of patients felt like they truly understood what are they going to have to pay out of pocket? What are these costs that they're going to need to incur? And additionally, 66% of the respondents said they didn't even remember having a conversation about it where those costs were gonna be explained and think about that. You know, think about going into a situation where you might be responsible for tens of thousands of dollars and nobody says a thing. And when patients do report saying that they did get some information, it was because the majority of the time they initiated the conversation. But the chances are that, men, the, the, the truth is that most people feel very uncomfortable initiating these kinds of complex conversations. I remember very clearly um, this situation and this scenario. This was a, a woman that came into my clinic. She looked lovely. She had on a lovely outfit. She um, was very put together and we had a wonderful session, um, did an endoscopy. The woman ne desperately needed a downgrade to a puree diet. And I made the assumption that she could just go out and buy a blender and blenderize all her food. I had no idea that she was living in a car. And so again, it really, really is, we have to check ourselves. We don't always know what situation these folks are living in. They might be hanging on by a thread. And so it's always helpful to just sort of ask some probing questions before we just make assumptions. So what can we do about this? By having information that allows patients to better understand and predict what is going to be expected of them, we have to be able to have resources to counsel them. And so the benefits of financial counseling, while they're not gonna solve all their financial issues, they still can be very impactful. And this study highlighted that, where it looked at basically some of the positive outcomes that were associated with administering or having that service available. And so what they found was that the patients um, who received financial uh, counseling, that their financial uh, toxicity dropped immensely. So those people that uh, did not have financial counseling had a significant increase in financial difficulty by the end of the treatment. So it really does highlight the fact that if we can describe and go through patients' benefits, we can provide some resources, we can provide some options. Sometimes patients have the opportunity to change their insurance, to maybe take on their, their partner's insurance or their husband's insurance. They might be able to make some of the modifications. And this is a nice example of a checklist to avoid financial toxicity 
and I'm happy to make this available uh, to anybody. But these are just some questions that folks might not think about. So with regards to different services or resources that they might have through their employer, as well as uh, state and national resources. And here's a nice list of, again, some of the services we actually have here in San Diego. Um, can use it as a reference point for other parts of the country. Um, we also have some uh, wonderful head and neck resource programs through the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance, through Spunk. But there are, uh, they, you know, I think the recommendation I would make is to amass your sort of toolbox of resources. Um, you'll be surprised how often you will use them. And with that, I'll say thank you uh, so much. I welcome any questions and you're welcome to email me if you want any of this information or even just problem solve um, any of scenarios um, that exist at your institution. I'm happy to help. Uh, 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 Lisa, uh, thank you. That is so, um, illuminating and it hits so close to home for me. Do you mind if I share my financial toxicity uh, story? Uh, okay. So uh, it was late 2007. I had had four Recurrences, and my primary oncologist said, "If we don't do something different, it's going to keep coming back." And <clears throat> so he put me on a regimen. It was supposed to be twelve infusions, and uh, I went through the first 10, and when I had my explanation of benefits for infusion 9, um, it had been denied. So the first eight were approved, and the ninth one was not approved, and I knew I had a tenth one that would not be approved. Uh, each infusion was twenty thousand dollars, and uh, and so I called my insurance company and said, "What happened? You've you've approved eight of these, and." You're denying number nine. I had 10, and I, I decided not to have 11, um, which was the following day after my explanation of benefits. And they said, uh, oh, we made a change to our policy. Now, I've worked for a Fortune 250 company and a very, what I thought was a very high quality um, insurance plan. And, uh, and I'm now looking at $40,000 of um, uh, costs. <clears throat> and I said, don't you think it would have been right to let me know about the change in policy? And how do I see it? Uh, and she uh, walked me through the website, and it took 11 clicks to get to where it was buried. Uh, so I appealed it. And 
But I said I killed it. I put together this manual and uh, uh, I sent it in. <clears throat> and <clears throat> to me, it was very clear cut that the appeal should work because of how our plan was written. Uh, I had a call about three weeks later from a customer service rep who said, I'm calling you because I'm so excited to tell you that your appeal was approved. And, and my thought was, I spent weeks putting this appeal together with the help of some very smart friends and family. There's no reason I should have done this. And you may be happy, but it really turned me off to the entire health insurance industry. Um, uh, uh, I ended up not having infusion 11 and 12. Um, uh, it, uh, it is the um, treatment that I believe stopped my recurrences. And um, so, Lisa, when you talk about this can happen to anyone, it really can. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and with that, a few questions have come in, and I'd like to um, throw them at you. You know, Ed, I'll just have to say, it just shocks me because it's, it's just so hard to so hard to conceptually see how somebody could deny that as if that's what you're choosing to do as if this is something you asked for i always think about it like just the other day i was walking around the the um in our right in our area in our pod and there was a financial counselor that was talking to a patient and telling her um she has a, her insurance she has a twelve thousand dollar deductible and she just started laughing she's like how do you think i'm going to do that and i always say it's bad enough it's already bad enough to get this diagnosis and it's just talk about kicking somebody when they're down like you want an infusion for christmas like what <laughs> i mean come on it's so true you're feeling so shitty and you have to go through and fight for this um, in my mind i paid for health insurance at that point for 30 years without really needing it <laughs> but when i needed it <clears throat> they found a way to try to deny it so, okay Let's start with some questions. Uh, are you aware of a service or company that assists those of us with um, this uh, disability um, for finding work? Um, primarily because I have a speech impediment. This is a huge disadvantage to getting yeah. yeah, unfortunately, I've had many oral cavity cancers, glossectomy um, patients that um, had a couple where their prior employment was in customer service and sales. And so their ability to go back, go back to work was significantly impacted. Um, 
you know, I, I know that there are organizations, obviously, you know, there are vocational programs. I know through the VA, there are some vocational retraining programs, but there are also opportunities to look within um, groups, companies, nonprofits uh, that are very sensitive to cancer. So um, it is a tough, it is a tough issue. It is a tough question. Um, I, I know there's institutions like Spunk, support for people with head and neck cancer, the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance, but um, those would be some of the resources that I would look at. I don't know if they have a job posting board, um, but it is a big problem. And I think, you know, it, it, is, it is very difficult to find a position, again, where your voice and your speech is your method of making a living. And that has been just decimated by the cancer. Um, and typically folks need to go back to work. So, you know, I'm very sensitive to that. I was telling Elizabeth that, you know, when I retire, that's actually something I, I would love to do is to just try to create connections between individuals and companies um, and to put their beautiful minds and put people back to work. So I don't think that's a great answer, um, but I would really start with some of the cancer sort of advocacy groups to see if either they offer employment opportunities or if there is any sort of network of resources um, that will help out with that. Uh, I think that's a, a, an excellent place to meet in. Um, here's another question. My husband and I are professionals. However, we own our own small business and make far less money than anyone would suspect. Last year, my medical costs, including the cost of insurance itself, and out of pocket was more than a quarter of our annual income. We received gifts from family of another 60K. That is the only thing that enabled me to have care from special out of state. Most people uh, cannot do this. At one point, we thought we would need to sell our house to afford my care. So, not really a question so much as affirming what you have said and what, um, and, and my own experience. Yeah, and, and you know, again, we, we providers, we don't really think about it. And I'm just, very grateful for the comment, but I think that sums it up very nicely um, that providers need to have better awareness of this. And it's not like we can solve the problem for you, right? There's, but, but it is important because like, like the example I gave, how could I allow this person to pay an exorbitant fee for a service that you could argue you really didn't need, right? It was part of a clinical trial, but didn't really need. And how could I allow that to happen? But I didn't, I wouldn't have known. But ever since I started thinking, of uh, really learning about this, I actually look at insurance. I look on the side in Epic and see what their insurance is and see, you know, try to get a little bit of information. And I ask questions, you know, how are you doing? How are you holding things together? And it's, again, it's not as if I can solve the problem, right? But there are little things we can do that can ease the suffering maybe just a little bit um, and potentially offer some programs or resources through our, our home institutions. <clears throat> um, another question. Uh, doesn't the cost reach an out of pocket um, maximum at some point? That's a very good question. So some programs do. Um, some insurance programs will have a maximum out of cost. Um, for the majority of, 
of insurance programs, that is uh, that is a lot. It can be a lot. So there could be a maximum out of pocket of twenty thousand dollars or twenty five thousand dollars. I'm not quite sure how that works with Medicare. Um, I don't know if there's a maximum out of pocket for straight Medicare. Um, and again, I don't know if that maximum also applies to some of those additional fees or additional co-pays. I'm not sure, um, but but yes. And again, remember these these are individuals that are not just dealing with the um, sequela during treatment, but it's also after treatment. So this can linger for years, right? So hitting that max out of pocket per year compounded or confounded by the fact that they might not be working full time or they might not be working at all. So, you know, I, I think, yes, many programs have a maximum out of pocket that can be burdened in and of itself. And when you pair that with lost income from not working for three or four months or five months because you're in treatment, you can appreciate how that level of financial toxicity can be exorbitant. Okay. And uh, I would like to add on to that. If coverage is denied, that may not even qualify toward a detectable or a maximum. You are correct. So, if it's a non covered service, it doesn't even get applied towards that. Uh, okay. Um, um, have you ever had to go through a medical audit for coverage of requested services? And if so, do you have any advice? I have not. Um, I'm very grateful that I have not. I do have colleagues um, that have gone through some of those painful audits and it is painful. Um, you know, we speech pathologists, right? We, it's not like we're thinking about making money. <laughs> it's not like it's certainly not going into our pockets, right? We bill what we provide. We provide a service and we bill for it. And it's very challenging in this day and age to make sure that we're checking all the authorizations. I mean, you know, hopefully we have people that will do that. I actually just today, got notification that a patient I, I treated did not have prior authorization. Um, and, you know, my feeling is though that I just don't want that patient to get a bill because we didn't get authorization. So, <clears throat> you know, I think our institution can eat it, but I'll be darned if my patient's gonna get the bill because we didn't do our job. So, um, and, and we have actually, you know, had to reverse some of those fees, like I said, if, if it is an in-house error, but no, I have, I have not gone through that. I, I know that uh, we work for a very large UCs, really big, um, and I think mistakes are made all the time. And um, like I said, my emphasis is just on making sure that our patients aren't the ones to pay that price. Okay. Uh, um, one last question, and it's a little bit off topic from toxicity, but how do we encourage our loved one um, to eat when it can be difficult and depressing, only using a feeding, um, a, a true feeding, a true comes out of their uh, nose and they cough. So how do you how do you encourage your loved ones to eat even though it's pretty miserable for for you? Um, you know, I I'll never forget. I I had a patient who um, was so rude. Came in with her husband and he was the patient and she was just so rude to me. Um, and we had talked about scheduling a follow-up fluoroscopic swallowing study and I told her well I think I have an opening next week and she said that's not good enough and said you are going 
she said something a little inappropriate. It was, you're gonna put on your big girl pants and you are gonna make this happen tomorrow. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I I did. I actually was able to shuffle things around. I added on and actually added on the case. And her, you know, I was like, in my mind, of course, I'm thinking some very unpleasant thoughts towards this person. And the husband actually had to go out and use the restroom. And when he closed the door, she looked at me and she just started crying. And she said, do you know how hard it is for me every day? Do you know that I go into a closet? with my food and I put towels under between the door and the floor so that my husband can't smell what I'm eating because I feel so guilty that I'm eating and he's not. And, and she apologized and she said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being wicked. I just so desperately want to help them. And um, so I don't think that answers the question. I think, um, you know, I think that there needs to be some very honest and candid communication between, you know, patients and their and their families and their loved ones and finding maybe some strategies um, of how, you know, you can encourage your loved ones to try to maintain a normal, some normalcy of eating and, and having those celebrations. I have a patient who can have sugar-free jello um, and ice chips. And they will sit at the table and have their sugar-free jello and ice chips and have, have found peace with that. Not everybody could do that. But I think it's working within, with, with, your, with your speech pathologist to see what, again, knowing really well what you can and cannot do or shouldn't do. Um, and then finding a balance because we need our caregivers to take care of themselves. We need our caregivers to eat and be nourished and to just, be able to do some of those normal things because we need to keep them well and healthy. So again, I don't know if that answers the question, but I think having just very clear and open communication and dialogue with some you know, direction of what will work well within your family unit is probably the right way to go. And to add on to that, the story of the woman in the closet, that is not unusual. Um, so, uh, listen, it is the top of the hour. Um, thank you again for volunteering your time tonight to share what I think is such important information. And with that, Elizabeth, could you put up the last slide? Yep, it should be up, Ed. Okay. Uh, so um, I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, <clears throat> in about a week, we have a Meet the Maker uh, presentation from uh, I mean, for sure the name Progenesis. Um, and <clears throat> um, within a day, you will get an email from us um, asking for your feedback and also additional topics that you may want to hear. So, again, thank you, everyone. For joining us, Lisa, it's always a pleasure. And Elizabeth, thank you so much for putting all of the technical work together to make this happen. So with that, I'm signing off and good night, everyone. <laughs>